talk about uh, human organoids. So, so before I start, I'll explain to you what an organoid is, but really today I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about brain organoids, okay? But before we uh, launch into that, you know, you can make heart organoids, gut organoids, uh, glandular organoids, mammary gland organoids, all, in, in short, every tissue that we have in our body and that have a stem cell compartment, you can make an organoid from. So, so an organoid is defined as a micro tissue that has both the architecture, the cell types, and the function of the organ that, 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 that you are interested in, okay? So immediately you heard that the word stem cells, and stem cells is, is, is sort of central to my life and my, my, my group's life, and, and stem cells are what allows us to build these tissues from scratch. Uh, and the stem cell actually imparts to them the structure that you recognize of a heart or of a brain. So let me go into that. So I always start with the acknowledgement slide actually because I'm just the figurehead, right? I'm the talking head, uh, uh, the guy that collects the money, that writes the grants, and that manages this amazing team of scientists, uh, postdocs, uh, 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 master students and PhD students and we're all working on there on level four in the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology just across the river on the St. Lucia campus. I also want to acknowledge the funding for all of the work that I'm going to show you little snippets of. Your tax taxpayers dollars, right? Australian NHMRC and um, Medical Research Future Fund. So thank you. Uh, and also both industry and a whole bunch of philanthropy groups because as you'll see we're using our approach to uh, to cure often very rare diseases that affect children. By the way, can you hear me in the back or do I need a microphone? Yeah, that's what my dad said. You actually need a, a noise dampener when I have a little bit of kids. So, we took the red pill about five or six years ago for those who remember the matrix, right? Uh, and and I'm going to show you that we can actually do this. We can actually grow not a whole brain, but uh, an organoid of a brain that has many of the functions and utilities. So let's start at the start, right? Remember that I told you that an organoid is built from a stem cell compartment. So what is a stem cell? I mean, you might have heard of it, and they're kind of cool, and you can maybe inject them and repair stuff. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, what I, uh, we work on a very special type of stem cell. So what is a stem cell? It's really simple actually. It's a cell type that will produce daughters that are identical, so in a process called cell renewal, and then it can make a choice to, to, uh, to take one of those daughter cells and that one will develop in a more mature cell type that you might recognize, like a liver cell or a skin cell. And, and you know this is happening because even though when we look in the mirror every morning, we kind of look the same, right? But you know in your heart that what you eat is being turned into new cells and to turn over all the constituents of your cells on a daily basis. But you don't stop to think where these new skin cells come from when you do that in front of the mirror and you see them coming off. Uh, you, you, you don't stop to think where they can come from. And they come from stem cells that live in your skin. Uh, and the same thing happens in your brain. Yes, you do make more brain cells all the time. Uh, and I'm going to tell you now that use it or lose it. And I guess that's why you're in gentle thinkers, right? You, you don't want to use it. So, what I told you is that, that there are not all stem cells are created equal, right? So this is my Swiss Army knife equivalent. So if you think about development, how we start as a human being, we start as an, as an oocyte and a sperm cell, happy marriage, and then start dividing. And pretty soon there will be a, a structure called a blastocyst. And about day five of development, and inside of those blastocysts are very special cells that are called stem cells. And those stem cells are the ones that we are particularly interested in because they can make all the cell types of the human body, like all of them. Right? So these are called pluripotent stem cells. Pluri, many, potent, powerful. Right? So the stem cells that you hear most about that our, uh, uh, um, our footy players get injected into their knees to get them back on the field sooner 
they are adult body stem cells, like mesenchymal stem cells, for example, that you can harvest from fat. You can, they are useful, you can inject them, but they will only make cartilage, bone, and fat. They will not make neurons or liver cells. And that's logical because you would be quite surprised if your skin would all of a sudden start to make liver cells, right? That's not what our bodies want to do. So that immediately tells you an important lesson that stem cells that are living in our body, they have been confined, they have been restricted. They are only allowed to see certain uh, bookshelves of the library, which is our DNA, right? Only certain book cells are available to those cells. The pluripotent stem cells have access to the entire library. They can make whatever uh, uh, you tell them to do. And then, uh, so this actually happens stepwise during development. You start the pluripotent stem cells, then you actually make those body stem cells that will sit in our, in our uh, organs, usually in special places called niches, and they make mature cells that we use uh, to move, to detoxify, to, you know, all the things that our cells do. So what I just told you, you can see here in real life, so this is a day five embryo, and here on the inside is, are these cells called the inner cell mass cells. These are these pluripotent stem cells. About day six or seven, they start to form a disc called the embryonic disc. And really early on, you can see there's a groove coming through the middle that will become your spinal cord, that will become your brain. It starts to thicken and actually makes three layers called ectoderm, that makes your skin and your brain, the mesoderm, that makes your muscles and blood and the endodermis makes your lungs and your glandular stuff. So it really early happens, really early development. And then this magic happens, right? I mean, they just start to make more cells, more stem cells, and then it turns, and then pretty soon you can recognize, like, ah, a baby, right? So that takes nine months, as you know. But the first steps, that only takes a couple of days. So the important bit to take home from this is that, that in this blastocyst, which is a really important structure, day five, there's this inner cell mass cells, and they are containing of the, they are consisting of these pluripotent stem cells. Now, in 1996, and about a year later, my then boss, Martin Perra, came back from 3911 with the inside jacket pocket, his the first embryonic stem cells that he took from Singapore into Australia. I had camped in front of his office for months already, said, like, you gotta give me a job because I know what you're doing. And he finally gave the job and then he gave them to me. He said, like, okay, go figure out how to grow these other the guys and figure out what they can make. And that's how my stem cell career started, I guess. But it tells you that you can get these stem cells from surplus IVF embryos, right? And many people that do IVF donate the surplus embryos that they don't need anymore, that were frozen in the, in the uh, and they don't take it to science. And basically what scientists then do is just isolate this inner cell mass and grow it. Uh, uh, and, and that's an embryonic stem cell line. Now, as you know, in the United States, that's forbidden, right? Because there's a debate on where, where does life start? So well, some say it starts here, and other it starts here. Islamic countries say like, no, no, it starts when you can feel the baby. So different opinions about when life starts. But in any case, uh, uh, this, this particular cells are called embryonic stem cell or pure bone stem cell. So this is how, how the game changed, uh, and I'll explain to you how that works. So this is, this is a process called reprogramming. And a really smart guy called Shinji Yamanaka in 2007 uh, started this, in 2012 got the Nobel Prize for this. And what he showed what we always thought is that development goes into one direction, right? You start with uh, in a fertilized embryo, then stem cells, then these adult stem cells, and then mature cells, and that's how it goes. And he's challenged that now, which is like, no, no, I think I can reverse that. And he did that by expressing uh, 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 four transcription factors, which are basically proteins that control the activity of, of DNA, of genes. Uh, and he took those uh, four genes, and he, not randomly, because he knew those genes were really important in those embryonic stem cells that I just told you about. So he basically asked the question, if I take the four master genes that control an embryonic stem cell, can I convince a mature cell to go back in time to a day five embryo and, and make a pluripotent stem cell? And I wouldn't be telling you if that wasn't the case, right? Yes, that was the case. And I was, I was at this conference in, in Cairns, actually, was, 
where he showed that he could do this with mice, and in a year later he did it with humans, and everybody just was gobsmacked, and everybody was on the phone like, okay, forget about embryonic stem cells, we're working on these induced pluripotent stem cells. Now why was everybody so excited about that? Well, for two reasons. So one, the fact that you can do this, right? And secondly, what you can now do is you can now look at somebody and say, like, you got Parkinson's disease, or you got multiple sclerosis, and I can harvest a little bit of your skin or your blood, and now make these pluripotent stem cells, which now turn out to be exactly carbon copies of the embryonic stem cells that made up you when you were a day five embryo. I mean, that's a mind spinner to me, right? Yeah. Just a quick question. What inspired that idea? Like, were there any previous experiments that indicated yes. that this process was reversible? Yes, he got it. He, he got it. He didn't get the Nobel Prize by himself. The other guy that got it was a guy called uh, uh, John Gurdon. Uh, and John was already in the 60s and the 70s, was taking skin cells from a frog and then taking a frog egg and taking the nucleus out and then putting the skin cell of the frog back into the egg. And then to what he saw is that, my God, they are starting to develop as dead bones, right? And he went like, okay, that's interesting, right? So the, the information is in the DNA uh, of the skin cell. The, the, all that information to make an entire frog is already in the skin cell, right? And then he showed that it doesn't matter whether you take a skin cell or another cell or a liver cell, so that's how it started, but he never figured out how to do this. You know, he could only do that by taking an egg and then taking the, the nucleus out, the DNA out, and putting the nucleus of a somatic cell or mature cell back in. So yes, but but that gave Shinya Yamanaka the idea. Go like, I wonder whether we can do this just artificially, right? Yeah. So that's how it started. So. What you can see here is, is, is why, the, why, the, why the party trick is so good, because you can start with a skin cell, you can go back in time to a day five blastocyst, and this is the model of, of, the, of Waddington, who thinks of development as a ski slope. And it's actually very really accurate, right? So here are the different cell types that your cells make, and they make binary decisions, like a skier going down a slope and then ending up with either a liver cell or a heart cell. So by taking a skin cell back in, uh, to uh, this really primitive state, you can now push it into the right ski slope, the blue run or the red run or the black run, and tell them to ourselves what to make in a dish. And this is how we make brain organoids as well. So in practice, it looks like that. So we go and take a little skin biopsy, but now much easier, two and a half mils of blood, that's all. But people have also made these induced pluripotent stem cells from hair follicles. They can just pull them out. Uh, you can make them from s cells that are shed in your urine, for God's sake. So watch out what you leave behind, right? <laughs> because a scientist like me can take those cells and reprogram them in about six weeks into these pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so this is how skin cells look like. This is a, a colony of about 20,000 induced pluripotent stem cells. They're really small. And then you can start to push them in the right ski slope and make, for example, neurons and glia. And what I'm going to show you today, brain organoids. Mm. Yes? Could you clone, clone a human being using this drug? Absolutely. You just got to chat. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can do it multiple ways. Uh, for example, you can take these pluripotent stem cells. They are pluripotent. They can make eggs and they can make sperm. And then you can self fertilize if you want. But you could also make what's called now called eye blastoids. So, so if you go back, so what you can do is, is this structure here, this this blastocyst, you can actually artificially make in the in the in the dish. And they have done this already with mice. Because as I said, you go to jail if you do this with humans past day fourteen of development. Uh, but with mice, you can make these artificial embryos by fusing the right bits together and engineering it, and they will then start to develop as mouse. So it's not a big stretch of the imagination that you can do this with human cells. But I haven't found anybody that I want to clone yet, and it's so amazing. <laughs> yes? Isn't there a contract where you can just go past the 14 and say not to do that? And you there. might, yeah, yeah, but we don't know. Nobody knows, right, because it's, it's against the law. Right? Yes. You might be able to do this on some oil rig in the in the Indian Ocean, you know, outside of inter in international waters. Yes. 
Yep. I want to ask, in year 12 biology, I was taught that you know, if the telomeres get shorter as the cells continue yep. to grow. With these, um, the induced pluripotent stem cells, do the telomeres shorten or do they get They get longer, longer again. It's a really good question. So what he's talking about is, is an enzyme, for those who don't know, is that every time when your cells divide, uh, they get that the DNA ends of the chromosomes. Remember, there are these big axes. You know, the ends get a little bit shorter, uh, and this is one of the things that happens with aging: is that when they get really short, cells start to senesce and become dysfunctional. You know, in, in our more mature uh, 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 bodies. Uh, and but what happens is that these guys express an enzyme called telomerase. So, so as soon as you bring it back in time, telomerase becomes active and DNA ends become longer again and now uh, it becomes immortal. Because that's I haven't told you, not only can they make everything, every cell type of the human body, but they will also grow forever, right? They are, they are, they are, they are truly immortal, like a cancer cell line. They're not a cancer cell line, but they are immortal. So that allows you to make infinite amounts of these cells uh, and it uh, allows you to also do experiments, for example, on, on lines that we have not used for 10 years. We just, we've done this and we took four of them and they just grow like it was yesterday. So yeah, really good question. Okay, oh yeah, let me just make this point as well, right? That, now this is a brain organoid. These are a bunch of brain organoids that are sitting in a, a tissue culture well, so how we've grown them in a lab. So just appreciate that they are not the size of a brain, okay? Because you may have come here and go like, well, I expect, you know, like a big ball like that because that's how I think my brain is. No, they're not. They are really small. And the simple reason why they are still small, they're going to get bigger, is, and you again intuitively know this, is that it's because you just can't get enough oxygen into the center of these little brain organoids to keep them alive. It just diffuses in, right? So what you really need to make bigger brains, which we are thinking eventually you will do, is to give them a blood supply and a vasculature so that they can, just like in, in a real embryo, they can become bigger. So yeah, I think that's an important point to make, that they're not big. So this is how we studied human brain development about eight years ago. So we took these pluripotent stem cells and we told them to become neurons and they do they do beautiful things so there's a stem cell compartment in the middle here right so you're looking at it from the top here and you can see that there are, there are there are neurons here that are moving in and out there are cells dividing this guy here is sort of interrogating and surveying all its bodies whether he wants to hook up with with, with other uh, uh, neurons or not uh, it's 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 a really interesting process, and you can see the different cells do different things, uh, but they are entirely confused. This is why they come. This is why they're moving all over the place because they normally born in a three-dimensional environment. So they are trying to find their bodies. Go like, oh, I need to find this neuron, and I need to find that neuron, and they go like, well, they're not here, and they're supposed to be above me, you know, not on a on a piece of plastic. So that changed when we did organize. So what you basically do, it's not very difficult. You take the same stem cell that you convinced to make neurons in a ditch, and now you allow, you pattern them into the right ski slope, so you give them a notch into the, into the, into the brain uh, ski slope, and then you allow them to ball up, and you basically leave them to their own devices. You just give them the right things to eat, you give them the right uh, 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 proteins that they normally see during development, and they just do their own thing. I mean, this is something that also still amazes me, you know, that stem cells have this innate ability without being connected to a body. They just following a program. They just following a program like, oh, well, I'm a neural stem cell. I'm supposed to make a central nervous system. Let's go, let's do it. And they just do it. And they do it just like during development. They build it from the inside out. So, so very early on, these, these little gray cells are stem cells and they make these progenitors and they come on the outside, and then what happens is that the next uh, set of progenitors actually moves through the first layer and starts to make a second layer. Because you may not know, actually, that your cortex that you are now doing all your thinking with and, 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 and your reasoning with, which is the outside right, of your brain, you know, where all the crinkles, is actually really thin, 
But that's where all the action happens. You're not, I'm not saying that no action, action happens in the middle because that's where it's connected to our hypothalamus that tells us whether it's nice or not nice uh, and, our, and, and all these other things that are happening and how we're connecting to our, to our movement system. But our thinking we're doing in the vortex and there are only seven layers of, of, of different cell types there. Uh, plus a few other ones that are sort of coming in, immune cells. But the architecture is, is, is a layered architecture. And, and again, when we look at these markers, you don't know, know what it is, but TBR2 marks one of those types of neurons, and CTIP2 is, is another protein that marks one of those different types of neurons, and you can appreciate that they form those in these beautiful layers. Yeah? What kind of signals do you have to give the, the stem cells to induce them to develop into different types? Okay, this is going to get quite technical, okay? But basically, particular signaling pathways uh, uh, and modulate MAP kinase and wind signaling especially. Uh, so this is going to get technical. They're basically communication lines that cells use you know, during development. They use different molecules to talk to each other and also talk to themselves. Actually most of the, cell, uh, of the, of the talking that cells do is actually continuously telling themselves that they are a liver cell or a heart cell and a kidney cell just reinforcing their identity and at the same time they're telling other cells next to them go like, hey i'm a liver cell don't think about it right uh, and just stay away or communicate me with me appropriately i think that's 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 the way to explain it so during development the same kind of communications happen and we just give those proteins you know uh, uh, we just drop them in the culture dish and they don't know any better where they come from so and then they also start once they start at this stage here they are starting to produce their own patterning molecules. That's why it's a self-organizing system, because they are starting to produce these proteins themselves, and they talk to each other. So that's why it's much, much better than throwing them in two layer, in 2D on a, on a culture dish, because all those proteins and patterning factors, they are going to the medium, you know, what are they growing in, and now they, they're not at the right spot, and they're not the right concentration. Yeah? I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but, um What's their antigenic status? Are they uh, recognized as the original um, donor or are they yep. are so, they neutral or? No, so, no. so uh, if I would take a blood sample from you and make it use pluripotent stem cells and make, for example, liver cells out of them, I can transplant those back into you and you will not reject them because they're yours. They have your own HLA status, they have their own antigenic uh, 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 makeup, so they're entirely yours. Yeah. That's why it's that's why everybody was on the phone after that conference because people went like, "Oh, not only can you make uh, uh, make them personalized, but you can also make lots of them, and you can stick them back into the person themselves and 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 fix stuff, right?" And this is where what's where, where pretty much the field is at is is making neurons from somebody dopaminergic neurons to treat Parkinson's disease, for example. Uh, uh, the latest clinical trial was putting retinal pigment epithelial cells in the back of the eye of somebody who has macular degeneration, and that works, and people see it again. So this is not science fiction anymore, right? This is this is happening right now. Making a brain or repairing brain damage, but I can already hear you think, right? <laughs> like a bit more complicated. Two strategies for that: one is to put stem cells back into the brain that are properly patterned and let them do their own thing and let them repair stuff. Uh, the other one is to maybe make bigger bits that really, uh, for example, if you have you know, damage to the cortex, you could imagine you could sort of unzip this and, and deliver this and it might actually do the right job if it makes the right connections. Another thing that's actually happening now in, in my old country, uh, the Netherlands, guy called Hans Klavers who made gut organoids. So for, for, for example, people with inflammatory bowel disease, which is a nightmare, you can, you can take blood cells, you can make these stem cells, you can, for example, correct a gene that gives you inflammatory bowel disease, because there's the other thing you can do, you can manipulate the genetic makeup of these stem cells at will. So if you have a bad gene, correct it, and then make uh, the cell type of choice, and then you can still put it back. So that's what people realize. So Hans Klavers makes these gut organoids and they put them up on the backside of these people that have um, 
uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And amazingly enough, these little organoids that just insert themselves into the gut and make now quite happily healthy gut tissue in a, in a gut, which is a disaster. So yeah, it's happening. You have a question. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a quick one on, yeah. on, on that one. So about these treatments that we've been talking about, like I, I, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, etc. they're still experimental, or is that already mainstream? You can go to the GP and it, No, not yet. Not, therapy definitely therapy. not in Australia. No, definitely not in Australia, but in, in the Netherlands, they are now doing clinical trials for that, as well as in Japan. How so, long do you think until we can do the EU? We can go to the GP and they'll refer us and we have stem cell therapy. Maybe five, five, ten years, depending on, on, on whether our local and federal governments uh, get their agenda right. I, right. I mean, this is a whole different discussion, but we still seem to be very narrow with digging stuff out of the ground and selling it overseas instead of actually, you know, uh, developing our own biotech industry here locally and that, or instead of buying it from overseas. We can do this ourselves. I mean, I could imagine that a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't like this stuff. They love it. They, they love, love it. it. But they can't sell their medicines anymore if people can repair themselves. Oh, no, they love it, and I'll tell you why. So Hans Klevers, who, who did the gut organoids, uh, 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 actually has now been recruited to Hoffman La Roche, which is one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in Switzerland, uh, to run their organoid-based screening facility. Because people have realized, and you may not know this either, is that about 50% of, of, of medications actually work for people, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's a little bit, it's not very good. Right? You, make, you invest billions of dollars to make a medication, and then it works only for a subset of people. And that is one of the reasons for that is that most clinical trials are done in mice, uh, or they are done in white Caucasian males, right? <laughs> so, so what you can do with stem cells, and this is what these companies, and what we do as well, but what these companies do, they make a bank of a thousand individuals from different ethnic backgrounds where, uh, uh, with different mutations, and then make these organoids and test their, or, their drugs first on the, on the organoids, because these are real tissue cells, and then see if they're safe, do they fix the problem, and then they go into, into a clinical trial. So, so it allows them to shorten this, 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 this pipeline uh, dramatically. Mm. So yeah, they are interested. <laughs> it's money. It's money, <laughs> exactly. So, so actually that's a perfect, that's, oh yes. Yeah, just so am I hearing correctly, um, is this uh, is the organoid technology in some, is it actually a substitute for um, live animal? Yep. That, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we as a society and our university, we want to reduce animal use, uh, and, and this is a real substitute for it. Yes. Yes. And, and that's actually a perfect segue to this because. because uh, why don't you do all this in mice, right? So, so one is that when well, you can see the size of the of the brain is quite different. <laughs> uh, uh, the complexity of the brain is quite different, and we know that if you, for example, knock out genes in mice that 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 we know give us severe brain disease in humans, the mice don't care at all. So, in some cases, it's it's kind of similar, but in many cases, what especially for neuropsychiatry diseases like autism or schizophrenia, none of the genes that you knock out, even Alzheimer's disease, right? We, we, when you have a mutation in amyloid precursor protein, which, which makes the plaque that gives you Alzheimer's disease, as a human, you will end up in Alzheimer's disease when you're 34 years old. When you put it in a mouse, nothing happens. To give an Al a mouse Alzheimer's disease, you need to drive three different uh, uh, bad forms like a bat out of hell, and then it might develop Alzheimer's disease after six months, right? Which is still about a quarter into the life of a mouse. So that's the point, right? And this actually goes to that point: is that that there is now there is now more and more evidence uh, that having organoid technology allows you to do less animal experiments and also do more accurate experiments that are human specific. I mean. If I was a mouse, I'd be as happy as Larry because how many drugs we have to cure diseases in mice that have subsequently failed in humans? I mean, there are tens of thousands of drugs that are in that category. 
So you know, that's, that's why pharmaceutical companies like it, because they spend money doing that, and then they find a drug, and then it goes into clinical trial, boom, boom, nothing. Right? Although with organoids, you've got another set of ethics. You do have a different set of ethics, and I'm going to touch upon that uh, on all those aspects towards the end of my talk. So yes, but, but very well spotted. <laughs> So, uh, Greg asked me to tell you a little bit what my lab does. Uh, so we do a lot, uh, but just to give you a flavor and what our philosophy is. So, so one area of research is to understand how mutations in our DNA lead to disease and especially diseases in the brain. Uh, so we started actually many years ago with Down syndrome, which is not a mutation at all. Right? Most people know no Down syndrome uh, and know what the problem is. They have an extra chromosome 21. So this is what we did. And again, the mouse model for Down syndrome sucks big time. You know, it doesn't show half of the abnormalities that people with Down syndrome have. Uh, so we made uh, IBSCs, these induced peripheral stem cells from Down syndrome, uh, and, and, and find that they have indeed very early onset Alzheimer's disease changes. They, they have uh, 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 problems with, in, in the brain, um, less, less insulation deposition, for example, and we can pick all that in our organoids. And we're screening drugs for them. There's another rare disease called ataxia teratasia, affects kids, they end up in a wheelchair when they're 12, by 20 they're dead. Uh, and their problem is that they can't repair their DNA. Uh, it's a disaster, it, uh, it's heartbreaking. We were the first to make this model, but as you can see, you know, we, this is just a short list of the many gene uh, diseases that affect mainly children. Uh, white matter diseases, for example, is another one, uh, but that's all genetic. And then some diseases have both a genetic component, so that predisposes you to disease, as well as an environmental trigger in many cases. So epilepsy, for example, is a really good one, right? If you, if you have brain damage or you fall on your head, you know, that in many cases can set off a sequence of events that will give you epilepsy. So, but not in everybody. So there's a genetic predisposition and then there's a trigger that causes the viral infection, like Bob did with, with, with multiple sclerosis. Alzheimer's disease, both genetic, but also uh, uh, environmental, right? Because, you know, how you behave and what you eat and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and our, our toxins we know can uh, uh, accelerate this process. And white matter diseases I've talked to you about, this is, this is where diseases where the insulation around your nerves, remember our nerves are like electrical cables, right? So they need to be isolated from the wet, messy environment to actually transmit their electrical signals efficiently. That's, that insulation is called myelin or white matter. And there are many diseases where this white matter degenerates, like in multiple sclerosis, or where it's not properly formed in the first place in kids with white matter diseases. And so we're screening drugs, we've made models for these, uh, and this is how we approach that. Then uh, we recently, and of course, after COVID for sure, uh, started to look at viral disease. And I'll show you a little bit of snippet of data on that, because I guess it's relevant, it's becoming more relevant again in a couple of weeks when the next wave hits. Uh, how, for example, COVID-19 impacts on the brain, right? Long COVID, brain fog, trouble remembering, can't smell anything anymore. Well, if you give COVID to mice, they don't care. Again, they don't care. You have to put in a human receptor for the, for the virus into the brain or into their body, and then they, they will actually get infected with COVID-19, but otherwise they don't care. Different matter with, uh, with, with human cells. They get infected really efficiently. So I'll show you a little bit about what we do there and, and, uh, and how we can screen for better drugs. Uh, recently, we were very fortunate to get funded for birth as asphyxia. Some of the females in, and may remember this from when they had babies, is that, that, that during, during childbirth, it's about one in a thousand cases, there's an interruption to the blood supply to the baby, tethered cord, placental disruption, uh, and the baby gets born and it's blue, and it's full of lactic acids, and, and it's not breathing properly, and this is a bad thing, right? Because, and that can cause cerebral palsy. Well, in many cases, that causes cerebral palsy. It happens quite a lot, actually. So we were, we, we, we considered, well, 
So the problem is, let me tell you what the problem is. So within six hours when the baby is born, you have to decide what you're gonna do. And there's only one treatment, and that's cool the baby down to 34 degrees, and that's it. So it's kind of medieval, right? I mean, you just cool things down to slow the damage process down. That's the best we have, and that helps 30% of babies to, to improve. It's pretty poor, really. And we really have no idea what's going on in the baby's brain after you deprive it of, of oxygen. And again, mice don't seem to care, right? They're born with 10 and 12 at, at, at the time. They, they, they can live in a hypoxic environment fine and, and don't seem to have any issues. So we consider, well, let's make brain organoids. Uh, and we tested out that this, this, this hypothermia dropping the temperature actually works. And now we're screening for better drugs that we, uh, and also for biomarkers. Uh, uh, human specific biomarkers that tell you how severe the hypoxia was, which part of the brain was affected, and what then is the best treatment for those, for those, for those babies, right? So that's a nice application, I think, for, for brain organoids because, you know, uh, I don't think there's a, there's a mother in the world that has a baby born and then a clinician knocks on your door and goes like, now, would you like to enter your baby into a clinical trial and see if this experimental compound will work? There's not a mother that says like, yeah, yeah, just do it, yeah? Or, or no, you wouldn't. You would go like, no, give it the, 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 the cold treatment because at least that works in 30% of the cases. So it's really difficult to do clinical trials uh, uh, that are human specific. And again, this is where brain organoids come into their own. And aging, we've just started to use smell of that, and I'll show you a little bit about how you can screen for drugs. But I suspect that this might actually be a, a little bit of an older audience. So I thought, let's keep it relevant. Um, uh, how you can screen for drugs that can actually improve the brain function. Just, yeah, just one question. Do you have a, ch a challenge? Is there any opportunity to get funding for aging? I've heard in the past that it, it's been something that governments want to fund because it's a natural process. So actually, the Australian Research Council does fund aging as a, because they're interested in fundamental biology. Um, there's a lot of funding available for you know, improving walking frames or uh, a better uh, health surveillance, you know, access, which are all super important. But you're right, there is actually very little research money, you know, to actually study new approaches, how you can improve healthy aging. I mean, this is why we ran an aging uh, center in, 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 uh, in our institute uh, for four years, but then we ran out of funding. But to actually do that, to use human stem cells to find better treatments to live healthier, longer, right? Reversing aging is also a big thing at the moment, uh, and uh, there's a company that has recruited 10 or 20 of the top scientists in the world and given them a million dollars each salary, which is unheard of in academia, <laughs> plus a, ma a massive amount of funding to see if you can, can, can reverse aging. And what they do, listen to this, what they do is they do a, a Yamanaka light. Right? So remember Yamanaka was the guy that reprogrammed for the first time these skin cells back to pluripotent stem cells and you asked me, do, do they get rejuvenated? Yes, they do. And not only do they get rejuvenated in the telomeres, but all, also their epigenetic makeup gets, gets reset. Uh, so basically they go back to day five embryo. So they're going, like, yeah, we don't want to go back to day five, but why don't we do a little sprinkling of these factors? In the, uh, and, 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 and Evidence suggests that you can indeed, you know, sort of shift the, the, the clock maybe 10 years back by doing a little sprinkling of these factors. Problem is that they also give you some cancer, but you know, to be wrinkles to be worked out, I guess, but that's, that's, that's where that's going. Uh, I think I already made this point uh, in your uh, answer to your question is, is to have why uh, uh, industry is interested because they want to shorten this bit of the pipeline or a drug goes into a human. Okay, so we don't work alone. Uh, apart from my fantastic team, uh, we have seen the light, uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, one of our robotic rigs. This is a three and a half million dollar toy. Uh, you can see we've got one of those Korean car factory arms that picks up 
plates are a bit of an incubator where the cells live or where the organoids live and then you can put it on an imager here which is basically a, a microscope on steroids it can then put it over there on this working space here here we have a, a library of compounds somewhere here cooled and what it does it takes a little bit puts it to the to the to the organoids of the cells uh, in a very very uh, um, precise fashion and this way this thing runs 24 7 in our, in our lab at the moment you just need to feed it fresh fresh medium and growth factors and fresh library compounds and this is how we do our drug screening at the moment so no longer by hand this gives me better to be a completely sterile environment it is yeah yeah so you need to count up where the hair nets this gets totally totally uh, uh, disinfected on a weekly basis uh, and only dedicated personnel can come in yeah spot on it seems that's behind glass yeah it's, so actually the whole room is treated as a as a, a, a and then and then inside is also in, in glass with filters and over pressure so that nothing from the outside can come in so we're just continuously blowing stuff out gently yeah i'm sorry what's that thing on the right yeah i was just about to go there so this is so one thing that, that organoids don't like is to bump into things, right? Just like a, like a brain. So what they really like is uh, to be in suspension. So here we have little young, young baby brain organoids that are growing in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this incubator, which is continuously turning and therefore they continuously fall uh, and they never touch the sides. That does two things, so they don't get bumped. That means that they can't fuse together because they have a tendency to fuse together because they want to make bigger stuff. Uh, and um, and they get more oxygen this way and more nutrients, right? So that's and that's a limiting factor. So they get a little slightly bigger and healthier when we do it in these uh, in these circular uh, bio reactors. Now, do they not fly the green jump, or is that not bad? Do they, they do bump into each other sometimes, yes, but they don't seem to mind that too much. They don't like to. They, they, these brain organoids are just like our brain, right? They're, they're like Swiss cheese, right? That, that's the consistency of our brain. So, so they are they are compliant, but they don't like to bump into really hard stuff. So, so yeah, we're thinking that when two of them gently bump, they sort of okay with that. And embryos and babies in the womb, get, they get abused a lot as well. Right? I mean, mums are doing chin and all that stuff, like, and baby just goes up and down. And it's, but it's it's suspended in fluid as well. Right? It's just like these guys. Okay. Ah. I hope I didn't mess this up. No, I'll just talk about this. So, so you saw that we were working on a, on a disease called hereditary spastic paraplegia, uh, which is a disease where kids have, have trouble in motor control, right? Uh, and in this case, we're working on a, on a disease where, the, where we actually have no idea what the gene does that is, that is, that is mutating. So that's a problem, right? <laughs> Because normally you can only screen drugs if you know a little bit what, what that particular gene that is defective does, you know what the protein that, that, so gene makes a protein, the protein does the job, and then you screen for drugs that improve the function of the protein, right? Or something in the pathway. In this case, we have no idea. So we went immediately to gene therapy route. So the gene therapy is, is if you have a, have a defective gene, we can give it a virus called an adeno-associated virus, which most of us actually have seen already, just, you know, like a, like a cold virus. Uh, but we can load it up with a gene uh, that, is, that is fixed. And then when we can, we can infect uh, mice, or in this case, brain organoids with the gene, and they will infect uh, the, the neurons and the astrocytes in a different part of our brain, and express uh, the, the right copy of the gene and, and therefore fix the problem. So that's called gene therapy. So this is really hot of the press uh, and this just shows you that in this case we, we have been driving not just the, the, the gene that was effective but also a green fluorescent protein so that we can actually see which cells are infected and they get infected really efficiently and it persists over a long time. So what we want to see, right? You don't want them to come back every two weeks. So another trick that we do, and this is very technical, but I do want to tell you because it's sort of the new age and this was Frontiers, right? So this is Frontier technology. And, and what we scientists are really interested in is, is the identity of a cell and, and how it's different or similar to, to other cell types. 
Now in the old days, you would just take a piece of brain or like of a mouse and you mash it up and you isolate what's called messenger RNA. So, so remember a gene wants to make a protein, but in between is something called messenger RNA. It basically makes a copy of the gene, which is messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA is read and that makes a protein, right? So that's, 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 that's biology 101, but not everybody is biology. So that's how it works. So there's lots of information in the messenger RNA, right? But it tells you how many copies, how active that particular gene is, because the more messenger RNA it makes, the, the, the more active that gene is, uh, and, you, and you're interested in which cell types express which gene. So, so my analogy is that in the old days, what we used to do is we just analyze a bar of chocolate, right? And where we would mash everything together and, try, and say like, well, so how much of that gene was active in this bar of chocolate? Well, we're not doing that anymore. We're now keeping all the cells intact and we can now ask each individual cell how many genes they express and, 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 and what kind of cell type they are. And so that's the Smarties analogy, right? So, so instead of making a chocolate bar, we're keeping them as Smarties and now we know exactly which ones are green, which ones are red and which ones are blue. And we, we do that with a brain organoid and we, and we uh, uh, ask how similar are cells to each other then mathematically we can sort of clump them together as you can imagine that and then we find all the, the cell types that we have in a cortex in a human cortex we find them back not surprisingly because i told you that they make the whole, all, all, all the data brain cell types but this is one way to tell that they actually do that and you can also start to infer relationships between these cells you can see that these purple ones are connected to these orange ones and that makes sense to us because they're the progenitors of these of these more mature cell types. So you can start to look where things go off the rails, for example, in kids that have mutations in genes that messes up their brain development. You can start to ask, like, okay, so which one of these connect connections is, is, is defective? You can imagine you can do that, right? But that's how we do it. Now the other thing we do, and now we're going slowly into uh, uh, more interesting ter territory, is, is we can also do EEGs. So most people know what an EEG is, right? I mean, you go into the hospital and they put electrodes on the outside of your brain, and then they ask you to read a book, for example, or do different activity, and then they measure your brain wave activity. And this is one of the things that uh, 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 neurologists do, for example, uh, to find out if people have epilepsy, right? So if you have epilepsy, your brain basically goes nuts, right? So, so you get all these spikes. It starts somewhere in your brain and it sets off this avalanche of activity which just it just goes through most in most cases throughout the brain and then people just lose consciousness or you know or can't control themselves or can't remember anything of that it's a terrible disease epilepsy so we thought okay well no let me go one, one step back so the problem is we work with uh, a pediatric, pediatric neurologist and with uh, 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 epilepsy experts and when you are unfortunate enough to be diagnosed or you have a kid that is diagnosed with epilepsy you go to the neurologist and they sort of look at it and they do an EEG and they go like okay it looks like focal epilepsy we think right because you can't look inside and then they go like you know what why don't we try this medication that worked well in the past with my patients but it's not evidence-based at all, right? Not evidence-based at all. If that doesn't work, three months later, you come back and you take a second medication on top. Three months later, it doesn't work, seizures not controlled, you take a third one on top. And then you can't take too many uh, uh, drugs, so you take the first one away and put a fourth one on top. And this way, people are gone for 10 years, not being able to control their seizures uh, because the, the drugs just don't work. In the meantime, the pharmaceutical company go like, oh, we got another 35 drugs for you guys. And these Peter's go like, hold on, you know, how on earth are we going to select which one is, is right for this particular individual? So we went like, okay, we can help with that. So what we've done, especially for drug-resistant patients, so we have taken 60 drug-resistant epilepsy patients from the RBWH here. We performed this party trick and made the stem cells from them, so they're now personalized purified stem cells. Then we made brain organoids from them. And then the first thing we asked was like, okay, do they show epilepsy? And to our amazement, they do. They do. They show more activity. And when we teach them with, with this drug forming a pyridine, 
which is known to trigger seizures, they just go nuts. They just go, they show epileptic behavior, whereas the controls don't. And the other cool thing is, is that in the vast majority of these patients, they have done whole genome sequencing. You know how you can sequence the, the DNA to look for mutations? So you, uh, the, the neurologist looked for about 200 suspect genes and they go like, yeah, nothing in there. Uh, yeah, we don't know why you have epilepsy. Now you definitely have no idea what kind of drug to give. So we've taken lots of those, of those complex uh, uh, epilepsies that we don't know the genetic basis of and started to screen drugs. Uh, and that's our mission. Uh, and, and so amazingly enough, and this is what I should tell you, so, so an EEG is where you put electrodes on the outside of the skull, so we don't do that. We put our brain organoids on the electrodes. So under this little square here, there are 4,000 electrodes. You can imagine they are sort of sitting here. 4,000 little electrodes, and they listen in on the activity of the, of the neurons that are, that are in the dish. And we sort of do three at the same time, on the same individual, to sort of even out uh, biological variation and then we do drug screening. So when I saw this, I, I was amazed again. I got like, like, hold on. So, so you, these brain organoids, three months old, they are thinking, right? We're not telling them anything, right? We're not, there's no eyes connected or ears connected to these brain organoids, but they are active. They are, they are doing stuff, right? As a neural network, they are doing stuff. Hmm. Think about that for a second. Um, has there been any application of this for mental health side effects? Yep, yep. So we have done the same thing for people with schizophrenia uh, and autism. Uh, and for example, in certain autism uh, 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 mutations or disease, uh, uh, gene mutations that cause autism, we can see that some of these progenitor cells don't move properly and don't end up at the right spot in the, in the cortex. Uh, so yes, so if we can fix some of those, it's really hard though, you know, if it's obvious like that, we can pick it, but we still haven't figured out how to ask a brain organoid whether it is autistic or not, right? That, that's hard at the best of times, or whether it's schizophrenic, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. So we look at single cell RNA, see, you know, like this, this cloud, we look at all the cells and see, is there anything happening anywhere that is not that is not right? And that allows us to zoom in, in uh, into that. But yes, and then but we have already started to screen drugs, for example, cannabidiol, right, which is one of those wonder drugs. I'm not sure how wonder it is, but we don't really know how it works. We know there are receptors for, 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 for cannabidiol in our brain, um, but yeah, we're using that, right, those brain organoids to screen now, different amounts of cannabidiol, what does it do, which cells does it affect, what is safe, you know, so yeah, again, you know, we can do some of that stuff. Micro dosing of, of uh, um, um, how do you call them? Um, psychedelics is becoming more and more, more and more popular as well, so we're starting to think whether we shouldn't be doing some, some of that as well. Yeah? Well, like you say, you can cure, but you haven't successfully cured, say, not yet, not yet, no, no. But are the concrete experiments on the way where actually people suffering from these? Uh... So we're really close with two of them. So like ataxia teleantasia, for example. You know, remember that disease where kids end up in a wheelchair and they can't fix their DNA? So we, are, we, 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 we did this model and we found that a nutraceutical, actually a, a fatty acid, could actually improve the function of the, of the brain organoids uh, uh, dramatically. And that's now in a clinical trial here at the Wesley by, with David Coleman. So that's where we are at here. Uh, so yes, we, we, are, we are about to prove whether, 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 uh, whether this works or not. Yes, but, yeah, but for the autism, definitely not yet. No, no, no. So yeah, this is, this is our program. Uh, so this is the old bit that I just told you about. Uh, 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 a neurologist sort of testing randomly, you know, uh, um, uh, drugs. Now we take a blood sample, make pluripotent stem cells, make brain organoids, screen the drugs, 
look at the responses and we also use artificial intelligence approaches. So where we put in both the clinical data, the brain organoid data, EEGs and our in vitro EEGs and let the neural network figure out you know, what's, what the best, best drug is because we humans are only feeble minds and AI. Uh, can pick things that we that we humans can't. Yeah. Two, two questions. Um, how likely is this process able to be automated so that it can be done quickly? So this bit we've automated, making pluripotent stem cells. We now our robot can now make brain organoids and do the drug screen. MEAs is still is still not easy to automate these multi-electrode arrays where we listen in on, uh, that is still because you can imagine you have to sort of position them right they're yeah. really sensitive yeah. robot not good sense. enough for that yes but having said that automated patch clamping where, where, where you can listen into one neuron that that is done but that's not all we want we want to we want to look at neural networks and ensembles of neurons that are working together yeah. uh, because that's the advantage of an organized model yep can I continue? Okay, so now a little bit about SARS-CoV-2. How we do that. So one of the things that we did is, so these brain organoids that I showed you so far, they, they are basically representations of the bit that we think with, right, the cortex. But we figured that we needed more because uh, we were interested in the impact of virus on the brain. So what we wanted to do is to also pattern this bit here, this red bit, this is called the choroid plexus. You've probably never heard of the choroid plexus, but it's super important in your brain. So as you're sitting here per day, you're producing two liters of spinal, uh, or, or, or spinal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, two liters, right? That's a lot. Right? More than you, we. Uh, and the, the reason for that is, is because our brain is, takes up most of our, our, of, our, of our energy. And all those waste products need to be got rid of them. Right? And this is what the core plexus does. It transports all the baddies out of the, out of the brain and it transports goodies into the brain. And it is highly vascularized. In other words, it's got lots and lots of blood vessels as well. So this is where the immune system talks to the brain. This is where the brain does its transport in and out, uh, and it produces cerebral spinal fluid, which is a really important uh, 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 clearance, me clearance mechanism. So we re reckon, well, it's very likely that the virus would actually enter the brain through the choroid plexus because if it's in the bloodstream. The other route that, we, that, that may be happening is via the nose, which is, as you know, connected to the brain, and maybe it travels up that way. Right? So we started to make core, and you see, you'll see this image here. That's just a slice of an organoid, and and all the red bits are choroid plexus, and in the middle we got we got blue stuff, which are which are the neurons. Long story short, we did uh, uh, what we said, what we were setting out to do. But then we wanted to give it a twist. So I remember that I told you told you about Down syndrome, right? People with an extra chromosome 21. What most people don't know is that people with Down syndrome are 10 times more likely to die of SARS-CoV-19 uh, COVID than even us, which is bad enough for us. And the reason for that, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, they have a bad immune system, uh, but there could be other reasons why that is the case. And luckily we had these pluripotent stem cells from Down syndrome people. So what we did is we took, uh, well, let me first show you this one. So, so this is the amount of viral uh, uh, virus that you can detect in, in the brain organoids. And this is what they call the choroid plexus cortical organoid. So this does have this outer layer and this is what we now call a naked organoid. So without that layer. And when we expose it to the virus, you can appreciate that the naked one doesn't really care unless you really pickle it in enormous amounts of virus. But if you have a choroid plexus there, all of a sudden the virus likes to enter the brain and do its stuff, its bad stuff. And we suspected that it might be the case because, this is funny how I can not talk to the general public about this because you know these things, the ACE2 receptor, yeah, you guys have heard about this? Remember where all your, 
all your vaccines are, are directed against? Well, it's the receptor for the virus, right? And guess where, the, where this ACE2 receptor is highly expressed? In the core plexus. It is chockers with ACE2 receptor. So I'm not, it makes it likely that it's a, a potential exit point. So I'm, just, I'm gonna leave the rest, but that was the main point of this, right? Uh, I'm not, let me just talk a little bit more about that. I didn't, I didn't do the data slide. But what we have done is to look if we can use this model to screen for drugs uh, that, that prevent the bad impact of SARS-CoV-19 on, on the brain. And don't be fooled, right? It increases uh, 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 neuronal death. It increases the deposition of beta amyloid, the thing that gives you Alzheimer's disease in our model. Uh, and I'll show you, it also makes cells more senescent. And it likes to infect senescent cells. So you guys must know that the oldies are more susceptible to COVID-19. And that's one of the reasons could be because you've got more senescent cells already sitting in your body. And senescent cells is another cell type that dramatically has upregulated the ACE2 receptor. So it's a perfect storm there, right? More receptor, more senescence, and then the virus itself induces senescence as well. So not good. Stay away from these guys if you can, and get vaccinated. If you're proud, you do our smart guys. You probably know what they are. So senescence is is one of the focus areas of my, of my lab because I think it's a really interesting and important process, maybe because I'm getting older myself. <laughs> so senescence, you already know intuitively what it is because it leaves senescence, is, is you know this, right? And when a leaf starts to look like that, it's old and it's dying. So what, why they're called zombie cells is for two reasons. So one, if a cell becomes senescent, what it does is excretes factors that tell the neighboring cells to also become senescent. Great, just what you wanted to hear, right? So, so that's what. So, the body has this part. We have evolved this mechanism most likely because it also prevents cancer. Because what happens with senescent cells? They stop dividing. They become big. They stop dividing and excrete bad stuff. But it doesn't become a cancer, and it doesn't kill you therefore. Right, so this is how, how our bodies do it. They sense that things are going off the rails and that there's two options like either kill the cell, which is sometimes possible, or make it senescent so it doesn't become a problem. Right? And of course, the older we get, the more DNA mutations we have, uh, the more our mitochondria, our energy pro producing uh, uh, parts in the cell work worse, all of that leads to increase in senescence. So, so anyway, so what we did is uh, is to expose our brain organoids to the different strains, actually in this case, of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2. So the blue ones haven't seen virus at all, the dark gray ones have seen Wuhan, and that's the Delta. And we're doing the more recent ones as well, uh, like Omicron, but not ready yet. And then we measure uh, a protein called senescence-associated beta-gal, doesn't matter what it is, the more blue, the more senescence, okay? And it's really obvious that the delta one, especially, and we can measure that as well, the delta one really induces senescence in brain organoids. Stay away from this guy. Now, can we do something? Oh, yeah, so the other thing that we observed so is- so just, yep. just a quick question to the previous slide. Yep. Does it also mean that uh, this could be like infected again? If, if, if it's getting infected at all, Yes, yes, very true, very true, very true, yeah, very true. So uh, what we can see is that we can see the spike protein, for example, of the virus, uh, as well as its uh, nuclear capsid. So the, the red here, we can see virus, and P16 is a protein that is specifically expressed in senescent cells. And you know, I don't have to belabor the point, you know, they are, they are at the same spot at the same time. Uh, and also the amount of damage. So gamma H2X is, a, is an indication of how much damage your DNA has incurred. Well, have a look at that, right? The amount of DNA damage foci that after you've seen uh, 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 um, uh, the virus, it goes up dramatically. Stay away from this guy. Uh, where am I going? 
my drunk yes here we go Okay, so can we do something about that? Because I thought you're going to be doom and gloom, right? Can we do something about that? Well, we can actually. There are compounds called xenolytics. So, as you can smell, xenolytics are compounds that specifically kill senescent cells. Uh, and you might know some of them. This is uh, uh, this is quercetin and the second app, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. You can actually buy these on the internet. I wouldn't recommend taking them as yet, but they have really interesting compounds. So they get rid of these senescent cells from your brain in this case. And what we observe is when we do that, uh, we see that uh, when we treat it, the amount of of, uh, of viral loads as well as the amount of senescence is reduced in our brain organism. So that tells you two things, right? So, so when, when you get rid of your senescent cells, because they are really you know, susceptible to being infected with the virus, you can, you can, you can, get, you, you can prevent uh, uh, further infection uh, more efficiently, but also you can prevent the bad things that are happening downstream from being infected with the virus by getting rid of your senescent cells. So, so yes, xenolytics uh, are really interesting and important compounds, uh, and some of them are already in clinical trials, for example, for Alzheimer's disease. So it would be really interesting to see what happens to that cohort that we're also seeing uh, COVID-19 and if that works. So, yes, I think that's an advantage of brain organ. Uh, quick question there. Yeah. Um, is senolescence specifically bad if you don't want to call it? Man, have you read my grant? <laughs> Did you read my grant? That, that is exactly what we've done. Because we, we, we thought like, okay, so is this COVID specific? Or is this just a general response to any virus? The answer is not every virus, but many viruses, right? So one of the things that we've been looking at is Japanese encephalitis virus. As you know, it's now a mosquito-borne virus that is coming north. You know, uh, uh, or south <laughs> uh, into Queensland, you don't want to get this stuff. Dengue fever, same thing. Uh, we're looking at what was the other one? Oh, I have one other one. Dengue, chikungunya, chikungunya virus as well. So, all of these viruses effectively infect these brain organoids. They don't all infect the same cell types at the same, uh, same but many of them seem to be also induce senescence. So that means people who live in communities but are isolated who get sick very rarely, they should stay younger for longer, right? Yeah. As a rule. Yeah. Yeah, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, so this is another virus that you may have heard of. This is endemic in Brazil, uh, Zika virus, uh, and we worked on that before the COVID. Uh, again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, a, a scientist to see what's happening here. Uh, uh, if you expose it to the to the Zika, to, to the virus, your brain organoids don't go properly, and because it kills the, those stem cells, those neural stem cells that make new brain cells. And this is why these kids have really small brains, because that's what Zika virus does. So together with uh, a bunch of virologists, uh, Alex on the Chromic in particular, and Subi from the QIMR, uh, they looked at the virus and they figured out that there were particular parts of the jackets that were, that were important. They knocked those out. Now uh, this particular modified Zika virus doesn't cause disease anymore in mice and also doesn't reduce the size of the brain organoids anymore, but still induces an immune response really effectively. So that's a potential vaccine for Zika virus that the people in Brazil uh, could uh, make good use of. So I hope you're getting a flavor, right, of what how versatile brain organoids can be and how useful they can, they can be. This is a story about Clotho. Uh, Clotho is the Greek goddess Remember that there was a goddess that, that spun the, 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 the wool and then one that eventually cuts it when you die? A cloth is the one that, that, that cuts it eventually. 
Clotho, uh, a, a gene that, uh, that uh, uh, was named after Clotho because if you are lucky enough to have a particular variant of this, 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 this particular protein, you become usually 100 or 110 years old, you never get Alzheimer's disease at all, and you have a really good memory. I would love to have that gene, personally. And when you put it in mice, so you, uh, you artificially uh, uh, put too much of this gene into a mouse, these mice live 40% longer. That would be cool. I'll, I'll sign for that. The problem is that we don't have this disease, uh, this gene. And why we know very little about clot though is because it's a complex protein, it sits in a membrane, it's long, there are different forms of it, uh, and it's also in your kidney, uh, and nobody had any idea what it was doing in the brain. Can we buy that in Amazon? Can you buy that? Can you buy that now? On Amazon? <laughs> no, not yet. Yeah. But we're working with a biotech company to see if we can make this and actually deliver this to the brain efficiently. Yes. So uh, again, long story short, uh, one thing that we saw when we when we made our organoids pretty pretty old, we saw an increase in senescence in these in these organoids, uh, and at the same time that senescence increased, this protein clotho uh, fell. So it was being upregulated, and then at about 10 weeks, it stopped being produced, and all of a sudden our cells became senescent. So that's kind of suggestive. But then we did a trick. Uh, we used a genetic trick where we, uh, that we used to particularly upregulate or activate genes in our stem cells in a very specific, specific fashion. It's pretty technical, but we use an enzyme called Cas9. Have you guys heard of that? Have you heard of CRISPR? Yes, CRISPR. So, yeah, love CRISPR, me too. Yeah. It's great. CRISPR is basically smart scissors that are at, with, with a GPS system that allow you to find any bit in our DNA and specifically make a cut there, right? So it's really handy for genetic engineering. It's a game changer, really. Doubtner and Sharp and J, two women, got a Nobel Prize for that one last year. So what we've done here is we've inactivated the cutting ability of this enzyme but we fused it to what's called a transcriptional activator. So this is a, this is a, these are three proteins that, that say to a gene, become active. And then we use the, the, uh, a gRNA, so which is a little, a little barcode that enables our GPS system. This allows you to find the right bit in the genome. Cas9 is now there, but it doesn't cut, but it delivers this activator like a gas pedal, and now we can activate that gene at a time of our choosing in a very specific fashion. I mean, that's a pretty cool trick. So then we did that trick with Clotho. So in this case, we added doxycycline, which is, which is the compound that, eat, that, that activates this, this artificial uh, gene, gene activation program. We upregulated Clotho. Long story short, now there's no longer senescence. Uh, as soon as we add Clotho, all the bad things, these are these factors that are excreted by senescent cells, they also stop. So we, can do, we stop senescence and we also stop the zombie quality of the, of the senescent cells. So Clotho, uh, I would love to have a pill of that. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so, and everybody wants one. Uh, maybe good thing to live 40% longer, I don't know. Maybe second career, but definitely live healthier without Alzheimer's disease. So we're working with a biotech company to see if we can use our system to screen drugs that they have found can upregulate clotho, and then we see if they work on brain cells. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it also increase the cancers? Clotho, actually not. No, okay. no. Clotho is one of those. It's like a hormone. It has not been linked with increased cancer. Yes. Yeah, so it's a different. That's why I like it. It's different from these the, the other rejuvenation strategies. Yeah. Man. Question: How does exercise and being very fit change all these chemicals inside the brain? Uh, not my research, but research done at the QBI. Yep. Uh, and things like growth hormone, for example, are massively increased in the brain, and, and they certainly stave off Alzheimer's disease and, and increase neurogenesis. So exercise increases making of new brain cells. Okay. So, in other words, if you exercise, you won't need to take all these big fancy drugs. And yes, well, maybe, ideally, it will yes. help. It will certainly help. I because mean, my I, understanding I, I know, of what know. you're saying there, if you're looking at all these exercises, and you know, we're doing very active, 
then the brain or the body, should, if you're eating healthy, should actually be making some of these that needs it because the brain will program itself to put the what it needs it. Because yeah. the thing is why people put on weight is they have a high carb diet instead of a high protein diet. So the brain craves more protein than they eat more carbohydrates. And that's why they put on weight. Sure, I, 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 I agree with most of what you say. Yep. Um, the problem is, is that clotho, we know that, that clotho in itself is not sufficient, right? Because, because the general population does get Alzheimer's disease. And yep. I know even very active uh, centenarians, yep. they still get Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so but not to the same extent. I mean, even when you get 95, your not, mind's not quite as good. Look at Joe Biden. Yeah, example. it's a good thing to exercise. I totally agree because it increases neurogenesis. And before you came here, I, 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 I made the point that our brains work on the principle that use it or lose it. Yeah. Right? So the more brain cells you make and the more active you keep them, the longer you will, you, you will, you will have a healthy brain. So that exercise helps that. Right? It increases blood supply. It increases uh, the, the removal of, of toxins from the brain, and, and it also increases your hormone profile. So all of those things are happening for sure. Clotho itself, though, still drops yep. in centenarians, even though even if they exercise. Okay. So what? Where does that come in terms? So I'm asking a lot of questions now. Where does that come in terms of natural food products? Sorry, I think this is a bit off topic. Yeah, this is a bit off. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I don't know. I might touch upon that a little bit at the end of the talk uh, 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 on, on how to do that. Anyway, we pass this. So I'm almost there, guys. So this is goes towards towards what I told you is why those brain organs don't go bigger than a pea or a lentil uh, because they don't have a blood supply. So in this case, what we've done is we put progenitors, also from stem cell derived uh, uh, human uh, progenitors that make blood blood vessels. And you can appreciate that they actually invade these organoids, they make, they make uh, proto-vessels. The problem that we now face with is like, how on earth do you get blood flowing through these, right? You need to have somehow hook this up with little micro needles and sort of get a patent vessel and get a blood supply through that. I haven't solved that yet, we think we can. But just to show you where we're at, this is about the Fortier's technology, this is where we're at. We can make blood vessels in there, but they're not very useful yet. However, what they also do, and this, somebody asked me about this beforehand, you did, yeah. yes, about the rats. So what you can do, and now it's starting to get icky, you can make human animal brain chimeras. So what we've done here is we've taken here a mouse, and this is a very special mouse that doesn't have an immune system, so it doesn't reject any foreign uh, grafts. So I can put a human piece of kidney in there and it will not reject it because it doesn't have an immune system that will recognize it as not self. We scoop a little bit of its brain out, poor thing, and it can handle that. Mice are tough as nails. Uh, and then we pop a brain organoid back in, a human one in this case. And then about three to six weeks later, to our delight and surprise, and maybe dread as well, is that in, in yellow here, so the brain of the mouse sort of goes like this, and this is a piece of human brain tissue that has integrated into the mouse brain, gets blood vessels from the mouse, happily lives there, and, and is quite okay. Now, why would we do a thing like that to a mouse? You, I hear you ask. <laughs> well, the first thing is, is that because when pharmaceutical companies screen drugs, right, they use mouse, mice a lot, and we are now arguing, like, no, you need to use organoids. But they then come back to us and say, like, yes, but your brain doesn't sit behind, you know, a blood-brain barrier, it doesn't have an immune system, and when we inject our drugs or give it orally, you know, those drugs, you know, have to go through the liver and then get metabolized. It's not the same thing, right? So we're like, okay, what if we put pop the brain organoid into a mouse that you, you're used to and you now can still screen the effect of your drug on the human brain tissue, but now it sits in a, in a real brain environment. And then we're like, yeah, brilliant. So that's one of the reasons. Except for the poor mouse. Hey? <laughs> Except for the poor mouse. Except for the poor mice, yes. Uh, yeah, mice. I, I argued before that I would like to be a mouse because there's more drugs already discovered for them than for humans, but not for this case. 
Yeah, you and I do. Yeah, so I was just going to say, how much of it did you replace? I mean, is this, is obviously... We are testing out hippocampus, which is much harder because it's right in the middle of the brain, so you need to really damage the brain to pop something in there. Yeah. Uh, we haven't seen how far we can push this yet. Yeah, does, does it um, re-engineer itself to become hippocampus? No, we can we can pat yeah we can pattern it as a hippocampus uh, and then and then pop it in there. Um, so I don't know how many holes you can make in a mouse brain uh, and still get away with it. Right, that even they have limits. <laughs> uh, no, he was first, and then you. Um, uh, this is pretty frontier, like. Yeah. That was the title of the talk, man. <laughs> so there's been no scanning of this to see what sort of activity happens compared oh, yeah. to the other rest. Ah. So does this new component function different to the rest, or does the rest adjust to account for the new component? So it does connect with the mouse brain, and it does make functional connections with the mouse brain. Uh, the mouse, in this case, the mouse uh, is not demonstrably smarter. If that's what you're uh, thinking yeah. about, it's not demonstrably smarter yet, but we haven't left it there for months and months and months. This this was just two screen drives, <coughs> so it may get smarter. We suspect it might get smarter because other researchers have done a different trick, where they put. Now let me let me explain what they did. Right, so our brain has two main cell types. Right, so one are the neurons that do all the work and that that, that connect with us and and that make us think and then there are astrocytes and astrocytes are thought to be the support cells they supply all the, the all the food to the neuro neurons uh, and they, they they're really important to keep the, the neurons happy and alive and they actually do much more than that but but that's for for this for this purpose that's that that should be sufficient so when they deleted the astrocytes in a mouse so this mouse uh, is now is can now not make its own astrocytes and then put human astrocytes back into the, the, the developing mouse brain, those mice were about 40% smarter. And the reason for it is that a human astrocytes make more connections with neurons than the mouse ones. I told you that mice and humans are not the same. And those mice were, were actually smarter. So I don't think, I don't know how our ethics committee would look at that if we would actually start doing that kind of stuff. And we, that's why we had to stop these experiments early before we would even see that. But, but this is very edgy, right? I mean, and, and, and in, in other systems, you may, you may or may not know this, but there's a school of thought that suggests that we should not make our own transplantable organoids in pigs, for example. And, and that's doable, actually. That you can, has already happened, right? That's already happened, not, not transplanted yet, but yes, you can make a pig that, that lacks a gene, for example, that is essential for making a pancreas. And when you go back, remember, when you go back to the blastocyst really early on, that little five day old thing with the inner cell mass on the inside, if you now inject a small amount of human uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells into a pig blastocyst, they just happily integrate with the developing pig and then just like in Jurassic Park, the, 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 the pig just makes all the different organs, but there is a niche because it can't make a pancreas. And then the human cells are like, well, we can, but we don't have the mutation. So all the whole pancreas is made out of human cells. And eventually when you put human vasculature in there as well, you could imagine you could make a pig that has a pancreas or your heart, a human heart that would be ready for transplantation and you have them running around. How ethical that is? I'm not too sure. Is it work? Uh, no, this is what well, uh, this is what I was saying. So when they did that, they actually had to engineer their the way that they did it in such a way that those cells, as soon as they became brain, they were killing themselves. They had to do that because they could not afford the risk to have a a, a pig running around with a big brain, with a pig brain, uh, a pig running around with a human brain. So what's that? I mean, why not? Other than ethics, why not? Can you imagine a conscious, a conscious human brain in a pig? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's one of the Seinfeld episodes that covered this. <laughs> 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 Sorry, we got a question. It was, it was very similar, actually, to the last question. Okay. I, I guess just another take on it. It'd be 
knocked out a part of a mouse brain and replaced another part, like you're talking about hippocampus. Yeah. Could it? Uh, do you know yet if it would be likely to be functional? Like if they lost the capability? Yeah. The evidence suggests that, that it can it can it can make functional connections with yeah. the, with the mouse brain. Yes. Yeah. The other thing uh, that, that's already been done, for example, is putting human uh, glioblastomas, for example. You know, a, a brain cancer that will more than likely kill you. Right. Those guys, those glioblastoma cells will actually make functional connections with other cell types and have sort of feed off them uh, and fuse with them. And that's also been modeled in a, in a human, so human glioblastoma with human brain tissue in a real brain environment. And, and that way you can find better drugs. Yep. Just so I'm clear, you go to that five day point? Yep. And you can, you can organize it so that there's a part of the, uh, a part of the body uh, in that mouse that you can uh, program to not be created uh -huh. and then you can put in the human uh, cells or another species yep. uh, and end up with a complete with a with a sort of a, just a substitute part correct that's simple well not simple but that's yeah a, that, that's the no it's that simple i agree so in other words, what you could do is you could take a human, put a cell in there, and you have all these zombies walking working for you as well. They wouldn't be conscious. You just tell them to do stuff. So it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> a brainless, a brainless body. <laughs> you know, the human with a pink brain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So we could do the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. In China. Yeah. Right. So forget what's happening in your new future. You're thinking about moving to Australia. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's a really good question, uh, uh, and the answer is we don't really know. Uh, what I do know is that many, many of the scientists are funded by the Defense Department, like in the United States as well. You know, things like DARPA, you know, which is the American, uh, uh, you know, these are the people that that, that design mine hunting dolphins and stuff like that. You know, they, they are interested in this kind of stuff. And in China, undoubtedly as well. Better, better, faster, more resistant soldiers that don't age. Um, they, they were in trouble some time ago when they did the, fr so we as a community have decided that we're not gonna CRISPR genome edit the germ line. So, so I told you that with CRISPR, you can change any gene that you want and, and fix any gene that you want as well, right? <laughs> So, so we as a community have, 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 have taken the pledge, you know, everybody who is in the International Society of Stem Cell Research, that we're not going to do that in humans because that would transmit that, that mutation or the fixed gene or the more intelligent or better violin playing gene to the next generation, right? And, and that would be unethical, right? Because now we are messing with our own germline. So, so everybody decided that was not that we're not going to do that, and then this guy Hay in China went like, yeah, yeah I, I already done it. You know, I've, I've already made a mutation that made these two kids resistant to HIV, and everybody went like, oh my god, right? So yeah, so yes, things are happening in certain places. You know, it's a little bit like Oppenheimer, right? You know, <laughs> uh, you give people the power, and somebody will do oh, crazy yeah. stuff. Oh, 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 whoa, whoa. Okay, uh, who's first? Uh, okay, you first, and then I'll just take it. I'll yeah. just go. Yeah. Sorry, quickly back to the science. Yeah. Like how old are these mice brains? Like, these mice, this were. Old, old mice. I did this in a two or three week old pups, so relatively young still. And yeah. is there a limit to how old? We don't know. We haven't tested. But and I suspect there is. Because you need some plasticity, the brain still needs to be developing, I think, to really accept and, and hook up with the foreign draft. And I guess the second question is, I assume there, there are some cell types that exist in humans, but not in mice. So if we you know, implant Correct. those cells in a mouse... What's going to happen? Yeah, yeah we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. No, and you're spot on. Yeah, this is from the from your QBI days. You know, th there's a particular cell type in our in, in our brain called uh, 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 in the ventricular zone. So so mice have only one ventricular zone, and we got two, right? And, and this is sort of an, an evolutionary trick that allows us to make more neurons. And this is why we got thumbs of more neurons than mice. 
uh, and mice don't have those. Uh, yeah, uh, no, no, the, I, I, was, I said yeah. I was going to go uh, this way, so, so yeah. you had uh, a question. Just a quick one. Um, you mentioned around using CRISPR in humans. I've heard there was the first treatment of a, rare, a patient with a rare disease, so just curious. What True. You said, yeah. 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 So you can do good with it as well, absolutely, but that was not germline. Yeah. If I remember correctly, that was Timothy syndrome, which was, I think, in the eye. So they, they, what they did is just corrected the gene in the cells that, 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 that in the eye. And so, so it didn't change the genetic makeup of the gonads or of the sperm or of the eggs or whatever gender it was. And therefore there's no risk that this, that this is going to be transmitted to the ge next generation. Yeah. So that's much safer and much more ethical way to use CRISPR. And do you think we're just tying our hands until we understand the impacts more, like until we have a better developed thing? Because it seems like an obvious next step. To start it is. Using, yeah. It is. We're living in a in an era now, in a really strange era that people maybe not realize, is that for the last, depending on what you believe, okay, so for the last 40 or 250,000 or one and a half million years, you know, we have been, we have been uh, uh, at the mercy of mom and dad doing a random gene mixing exercise and then you know see what comes out right so so this is the first time you can see over the next we can do it now but if attitudes change our species is now for the first time in charge of its own DNA and its own germline so I can see a future where very Gattaca like uh, way 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 you can take a, a, a pre-implantation embryo, right, just like an IVF, and go like, yeah, let's go screen it. Well, we need to change the violin gene, you know, need to put mutations because I want to have a good violin player, I want blue eyes, I want the intelligence gene, I want them all there, uh, and I want to have it fixed, right? It's going to happen with rich people first, in first world countries, but you can see it's going to happen. And if I was the Chinese military, I would go like, okay, I want soldiers that are, have really high reaction times, or, you know, yeah, of course that is going to happen. Question, what about the effective environment? You can have genes, but if you don't have the right environment to nurture those genes, sure. then it's not going to work. Sure. It's like saying... As sure, but, it's, but if you don't have to have the right genes, then, then no matter uh, how, how much you, uh, you, 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 you exercise the violin, you might become an accomplished player, but you will not become a virtuoso. So, yes. Yeah, but I, I disagree with that assumption. Well, and that's you can okay. disagree. Well, that's can, what we, yeah. can we tie back to the topic, yeah, please? Okay, yeah, fine, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. 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 yeah, that's okay. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Sorry. I'm still at death. I'm going that way. I'm just pointing to the screen. Oh, okay. All right. So, who was next? Yeah. I just want to ask a silly question: What's germline? Germline is is the is what you transmit to your next generation. So basically, your sperm in your case, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah sorry, I was just going to ask about the uh, growing the human organ in the pig. Yep. You have to immunosuppress the pig. Uh, did they? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're good. <laughs> From the work that you do professionally and all this is investigative stuff and so on, um, how has it affected your day-to-day -day life practically? Which bit? You, whatever you do, uh, all of this stuff we've been talking about today, how, how has it changed the way you live day-to-day -day in, in any way? Oh, God. This, it, this, our field is changing day by day. So, so everything that I told you has changed everything. Uh, it's just a continuously moving field. Like when Chini Yamanaka showed you could reprogram, you know, we did that and it opened up new possibilities. When organoids came on the field, we started early and now we can see all kinds of possibilities. CRISPR, we have adopted because it's an amazing technology. Sorry, what I mean is that, correct, maybe again, do you put your pants on once a bit of time still? Yes. Do you, do you uh, have cold baths? Uh, have you extended oh, your own life? Oh, have I been, I, I, have I, okay. Personally. Am I a David Sinclair? Is yeah, what you're yeah, asking. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I'm not a David Sinclair uh, uh, at all. Um, do you disagree with him? I disagree with him about the NAD story, yes, and, uh, and the resveratrol story. Um, 
but you know, the the truth will will be in the pudding. I I, I guess eventually he, he's, he's done pretty well for himself. Uh, I think there is a there is a there is so. No, let me answer your question. I have not changed my life uh, depending on what I know, except with the COVID story when I saw that and I'm like, oh, okay, so we need to be really careful. Uh, and and I've been trying to talk to our Queensland and our state health uh, 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 regulators that that it's not unlikely that 10 years from now, right? Or 20 years from now, there's going to be an avalanche of people that are going to have much more dementia uh, and much, much, much worse aging diseases than we had anticipated. I mean, now we have an aging society anyway, but COVID, I think, is going to come and bite us in the bum uh, down the track. That's true, because they've already seen symptoms. I've got a friend who's an Olympic fence who's had COVID and she's got major yeah, problems. It's very common. Yeah, really very, hard. very problems. <laughs> Not just mere physical, but physical problems, mental sure, issues. Sure, sure, sure. But, but yeah, the, the, the lung the problems are well that. recognized, but the brain problems and how it can increase yeah. aging and, and, and Alzheimer's disease is not recognized as yet. Yeah, man. Uh, has there been much work done on repeat COVID? Um, people say people have been infected multiple times. No, well, not uh, probably, but not that I'm immediately aware of. Um, but this is one of the things that we could try, right? I mean, this is what we can test in vitro. We can infect them once, twice, three times, five times, ten times. Again, something you couldn't easily do in humans ethically. Uh, but but this is why we're working always closely with clinicians because because once we find something, we go we, we go and have a look in the general population if that happens, or something that happens in the general population, can we shed light on that with our with our model? So it's just it's just bi-directional uh, uh, dialogue. Yeah. Do you think um, these organelles in brain organelles could be useful in studying in detail how functionally the brain works? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, oh just yes. An aggregate, but, yeah. Did you see my next slide? Oh, no, it's not, it's not moving anymore. Oh, no. Can you try the keyboard? What do I do? Uh, oh, yes, there's a. This is what you're asking, right? <laughs> In a way. <laughs> I so so can brain organoid be conscious? Right? Is I think is a is a is a pertinent question to ask. Well, you won't find the answer. So so consciousness is is something that's hard to define at the best of times, right? But one of the readouts of consciousness is, is, is a particular frequency, brain frequency in your brain called gamma waves. So gamma waves is just a, tiff, just a word for electrical activity in say the 100 hertz range. So 100 times per second, a neuron goes like that, uh, and a whole, you know, millions, billions of neurons are doing this together. And that is what, what, what you with an EEG you measure as gamma wave activity. If you then put somebody on an anesthesia, you know, you're still alive, you don't remember anything, but and what happens to your gamma waves, they go away. And when you wake up again, you can do the same thing in mice or in rats or in pigs, gamma wave activity comes back, consciousness is back. So gamma wave is a correlate, you know, an electrical correlate of, 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 of consciousness across the species. So you can see where this is going. <laughs> so when I took brain organoids and we see the same thing and we put them on our multi-electrode arrays and we listen in to our brain organoids, at about six to seven months, they are starting to show gamma wave activity. And uh, interesting, and then this guy is uh, uh, from the SOC in the United States and we have the same data. They compared the electrical profile of an organoid <laughs> and of a preterm neonate. Right? So I don't know, I have no idea how you do an EEG in a neonate <laughs> with difficulty, I would suggest. But, but nevertheless, they've done this. And when you compare them, we see that they are very much the same. 
and actually what we know also by looking at the cells and what kind of genes they express and how many there are is that the clock of brain development ticks in real time so let me explain that so when i take this day five you know, remember the day five cells that are the primitive cells and i pattern them into a brain and i look at three months and i ask what cell types are there how mature are they what function do they have it's the same as a three month old baby and at six months it's the same as a six month old baby and at six months they start to show EEG activity and so do ours and at nine months they are exactly like newborn neurons so we don't know what that clock is but 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 there's some inbuilt clock in our in our in our development that says like this is how much it takes and for a mouse it's 18 days and for a dog it's their gestation time so so it's really interesting is that that somehow hardwired in our dna is is the, is the rate of our brain development and when you do it from stem cells in a dish in a laboratory in the dark it still ticks yeah is this the same for other cell types no no it's not it's not good question no other cell types mature or you can force mature them for example and we have no way yet how to force mature brain cells brains are really interesting really interesting and do these brain organize sleep Mm, yes, no, yes, yes and no. Now let me answer. One, they do show diurnal rhythms, so that we can look just like us. They have their, their diurnal rhythms. Yeah, we can measure that. We haven't been able to put brain organoids for 24 hours on a multi-electrode array and collect data. And not because we can't, but within two minutes, we collect two terabytes of data. So we just, we just don't have supercomputers big enough to do it for 24 hours. But as an interesting question, when I was talking to Greg, one of the things that we have just been funded for together with another group is to model narcolepsy. So these are people that stand here and then just fall asleep, right? Just like that. But this is a genetic issue. And this is, this is because the hippocampus, there are, there, are, there, are, there are cells that produce particular proteins and hormones that control sleep. He can tell you more about that than I am. But we can now make organoids that have the same cell type, that produce these same molecules. And maybe when we put one of those together with one of these brain organoids, maybe now they will start to talk to the, to the other brain cell types and go like, look, it's time to sleep. So not there yet, but we can measure certain things, but I, yeah, that's where, where I don't know. So narcolepsy is a switch in the REM sleep, so it could be that they're um, mimicking yeah, yeah. What yeah. about hooking, um, hooking these things up to, hooking some of the cells in these things up to electrical signals and seeing if you can sort of, they can potentially solve problems or react? Mate, or, I didn't even look at my slide, haven't you? It's been done. <laughs> I have a description. You have been looking at my slides. So, but this is what we published not too long ago. Uh, where we where we ponder these questions, right? About about can we measure brain, consciousness and brain organize? And if we do, what do we do about it, right? Because th th this is a weird thing, right? If you remember that I can make pluripotent stem cells, and we've done this from people that are long dead. From the, in the 1950s, people donated cells. We made iPSCs. We can now make brain organoids, and they show consciousness after seven months. That's pretty weird in my book. <laughs> you know? Can you say that again? So we can take, we can take a cell, we can take a blood sample from anybody alive, yeah. right? And make a hundreds or thousands of, of brain organs that are all show consciousness. But we can also do this from people that are long dead. If somebody stored a blood sample in the 1950s, we can make these cells and we can revive them uh, uh, and, make, and make brain organoids that are conscious. You guys are not worried about this at all. <laughs> Another question. If that's the case, and say, for argument's sake, you build a complete human brain, that yeah. means he might be able to have a conversation and say, what's happened to me like for the last 50 years? I remember dying on the hospital table. No, <laughs> no, he no. Not, he but he won't memories. remember anything, and this goes to your point, right? So, so no, you won't remember anything. It's like it's, it's not like that identical twins have, have some mind melt with each other, right? Yeah. That they know. 
Um, I saw a read on the meta page that um, these organoids can play pop. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what the next one. Like that. That's what the next it? one. So, so where I was going is that, so in this case, this is a real organoid. So at the moment, these brain organoids are isolated, right? They are totally, you know, like it's like locked in syndrome. So this happens with really with people that are in a coma and have no way of communicating but are fully conscious, right? It's called locked in syndrome. So in my mind is maybe these brain organoids have, are at the moment locked in syndrome because they're not, not hooked up to any sensory input whatsoever, right? They're just dreaming. Right? Like a, maybe a baby dreams in the womb of something. But in this case, what they've done is they, and they may chew, of course, to make it look good, but these are proto eyes. Right? Can you, make, you can make the retina as well. You can make optic cup easily. You do have different factors at different times. You fuse them with the brain organoids, and now they become light sensitive. And when you shine light on these guys, the bit of the cortex that is the visual cortex is now lighting up going like I'm seeing I'm seeing so yes it's in principle possible to start to put information into organoids for example with light right but as somebody just said you can also make them play pop <laughs> so this this was our first time with 2D neuronal cells so basically what they did is they put two neuronal cultures or two brain organoids on a multi-electrode array with 40,000 electrodes. And they had some that, that and we can do the same thing where we can stimulate particular parts of the brain organoids and we can read from the other ones. And now you can teach them how to play pop. And they learn this in three minutes. So an, an artificial intelligence neural network, you know, the best we have, take five to learn this. Our brain organoid, three minutes and it learns how to play pop. It's faster than me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, consciousness, maybe, yes, there's signs of. Maybe there is a possibility to put input and information into organoids. And maybe we can even start to, look, to figure out, you know, how do our brains learn? How, what, where does consciousness come from? You know, uh, and, and, and learn how, neurons hook up in a different way during the learning process. Again, not something you can do in a, in a real human brain, right? But in brain organoids, provided this is ethical, you can. That's it. No, he was first. Yeah. And then you. Are, are you familiar with Jeff Hawkins' The Thousand Brains Theory of Intelligence? No. Okay. I, I, I won't try and <laughs> give it to you now, but it's basically, um, yeah, it's just a, a book I read recently. It's basically, uh, yeah, different cortical columns, each part of the cortical columns is building a different map of the world that all compete at once. Right, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, I know that. Yes. yes. So, which goes to a really important question, right? Can we build different uh, columnar of uh, identity, right? So, for those who don't know, you guys have all have seen a brain where you have sort of a map of your body stretched over it, right? And you know you have a visual cortex, right? So all the information that comes to your eyes goes first to the visual cortex. You have a motor cortex that coordinates your, your movements. So different parts of the cortex have different functions. We haven't figured out yet how to, how to precisely give that identity to a, a cortical organoid. But it'll undoubtedly come. But we'll need that if we want to do these kind of games. Does it have memory? So the next time you test it after a week, like, does it show that it has learned the game? Or yes, it, it has learned the game. Wow. It has learned the game, yeah. The question is what kind of memories can we impart into these, right? How complex can this be? So the other thing we can do is, uh, did I make a slide for this? Yeah, no, that's not the real slide. So the other thing we can do is now fuse different organoids together. Right? So when they make combinoids, go with hypothalamus, with cortex, cerebellum, eventually maybe you can take different parts of the brain and put them together and allow them to interact and really become an integrated system. Right? Uh, but yeah, that's really out there. Yeah, uh, back to the ethics of this yeah. research, like I could imagine that a team like yours is always on the sphere be hampered by the ethics committees what you're allowed to do and what not. Is there not a temptation for you to sort of shop around and say, okay, where can I do what, where I can do, where can I do most of what I really want to do? 
And, and the, the other question I have in terms of ethics and curbing research is there not a danger that they're going to do it somewhere anyway, say in Pyongyang, somewhere mm -hmm. where, where we don't want it to happen first, so would it not be better to be really liberal with what you can do uh, in order to prevent things from happening somewhere right. where they shouldn't be happening first? Right. So let me give you two, diff two different answers to that. So the first one is, is that Australia is actually pretty progressive as far as stem cell research is concerned. Right? And, and, and opinion polls uh, suggest that 75% of Australians uh, support stem cell research, which is much more than in the United States, for example. Yeah, but they're much more religious, that's fine. Yeah. So, so one, uh, our Australian public is well-educated and supportive. Uh, secondly, our ethics committee is actually not as much as a hindrance uh, 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 for us at, uh, at, at this stage. We actually educate them because these are these are ethics committees. They don't read all the papers, right? So we actually have a continuous dialogue with them. Say, like, look, you guys are aware that this is happening, right? You guys need to start thinking about it because I'm going to come with a proposal six months from now that is going to touch upon that, right? So I give them time, and I also present to them. Uh, and say, like, look, this is where the edge is, and then we sort of have a, a joint opinion on, on, on where we go there, usually on the conservative side, but I think that's a good thing, right? And your second question was? Oh, no, maybe, maybe it happens here and so there, you know, like, yeah. I young, you know, we don't know, I what's know, I know. I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't measure myself to what can happen in other countries. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd rather do the right thing, and this is why I'm here today, to ask your opinion what you think is the right thing to do, and, and we decide this together uh, in Australia. What's the effect on this on myelin? On myelin? Yes, in the brain. Myelinated circuits. Oh, yes. activity, activity uh, induces myelination. Uh, uh, myelin gets appropriately deposited at the right time, at the right neurons, just like it happens during development. Okay, because of my understanding, I'm sorry about this, that myelin is a thing, according to Daniel Goldman, and I see this myself, is that myelin is a thing that trains someone to be the great violinist with a little bit of gift, like the old saying goes, you've got 10% uh, ability, 80%, 90% correct practice no no that's not what myelin does yeah my, okay. my, myelin myelin myelination is is a process is actually really interesting it's controlled by at least three 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 cell types so it is a neuron that is ready and is active and has a certain thickness uh, it's a, a real physical physical thickness uh, uh, that's one that's one criterion that a cell that deposits myelin will look at this is called an oligodendrocyte is a specialized cell type that deposits the myelin. So I would look at that, I would look at the neuron. Yep. Then it needs an astrocyte that is, that is sort of talking to both, touching both, and, and, and the astrocyte is critically uh, important for directing this process. And then there are microglia, which are immune cells that are, that are continuously sort of taking bits away, and there's this balance between these processes. I have a question. So, all right then. So, for example, I'm on fence for 10 years. I jump on the fencing strip, I start beating people, and my brain's so well trained to do it. How does that affect with all what you're talking about here? Sorry, this it's, is just sorry, it's, it's yeah. just, just connected. You just lost yeah. me. Uh, no, yeah. no. Like, <laughs> sorry. If you haven't done something for ten years, but the skills still there, how does all this affect that? I think you're sort of missing the, yeah. the direction of the. I don't think it's related to this topic. Yeah. No, the only yeah, thing the only thing that I can so. answer is that 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 we do, at this stage we don't actually precisely know how we store memories and how we learn and okay, how we yeah, and how we recall, yes. right? Yes. And 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 this is a model where we be able to tease out how how these processes work okay. and then maybe improve them going down the down the track. Yeah, that's what that's that's what it's all thinking about, yeah. So, I mean, my question is related to the previous one, you know, hypothetically. Like, let's say somebody in Pongyang wanted to do this sort of experiment. But my understanding is that modern science is an international, you know, collaborative yeah. process. How easy is it, you know, for someone doing this secretly in isolation? And my understanding is, is hard. It's because, very hard. Because, like, the equipment that you were showing us is pretty complicated. You know, yeah. you have to collaborate with scientists all over the world. Absolutely. So it's not that easy you know for someone no. to do it in secret i mean 
I, I, I could imagine that if the, if, the, if the Americans wanted to do this, they could fund a DARPA project where they do this, right? But they would still need to come to scientists like us and say like, okay, so actually how do we do this, right? And what is your experience and who else needs to be involved in here? Mm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's science is teamwork. Very rarely do people do things totally in isolation, but like with the CRISPR editing of the of the of the humans in, in China, yeah. that still happens. Yeah, but he I mean, did end up in some gulag now. So I, I think yeah, he Even went to jail. Happy. He went to jail and yeah. he had to pay a massive fine, uh, and a whole community of Chinese scientists condemned what yeah, what absolutely. he did. So yeah, I feel like you know there there is the point to these international agreements. Yeah, yeah. And there will always be some rogue, but but we, we, we cannot be guided by that. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, just generally, what do you think of sort of the wildest things that could come of this? You know, in I don't know, a generation, twenty years, fifty years. Well, really, really out there ideas. Um, we might be able to make biological computers. Right? We were almost funded for a center of excellence doing that. Uh, um, biological computers are resistant to electromagnetic pulses uh, from, uh, from these bad devices that apparently the Russians and the Americans have. Yeah. So, so you can see that there's, this is why the defense industry is interested in these wet neural networks. You could imagine rockets and, uh, um, and maybe that have that are that are operated by this kind of stuff. Uh, you could I can I can see especially regenerative medicine, you know, where people have brain damage, where you might be able to replace certain bits uh, mm -hmm. that will properly integrate. We had a center of excellence in synthetic biology, also did not successful, but where we where we were proposing to take advantage of. Uh, engineering uh, uh, genetic switches uh, that allow cells to store to store data in in DNA, for example, and you can do that. So, so we could have we could have immune cells that are programmed to run through our body and do particular tasks. Like they see a hole in the brain, they go there, they make the right cell type and hook up just all directed by genetic circuits that we have engineered to be responsive mm -hmm. to that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff I, I, we, we can in principle already do, otherwise we wouldn't propose it for, 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 re for research. But if we can think of it, I think, I think we'll do it. Do you see some of these things, a lot of these things coming together to significantly influence human longevity? Yes. Yeah, I hope I made that point. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. I mean, there's the cancer on the other side, isn't there? With a lot of these technology, there's the yeah, but it's the same cancer. story, right? Like CAR T cells, for example, right? Which are which are your own immune cells that can be educated to see specific specific cancers and seek them out and destroy them are now already here, mm -hmm. right? This is this is this is the beta version, right? Mm -hmm. So in the future, you know, you can see that maybe a baby is born. You take some of its cord blood, you know, really pristine cells. You make induced pluripotent stem cells, like I told you today. You pre-differentiate them into different tissues, and you just store them there, right, or in organoids. Until you have an unfortunate motorcycle accident, you go like, okay, my spinal cord is buggered. You go like, ah, but I haven't frozen down over there. Let's just take them. We don't need to do anything. Expand them and put them back, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is in principle possible. But what about people living to 150 or that? Yes, I know the, the issue there and the modeling there. Well, but I see that the, most of the modeling suggests that we are just going to be, we're going to have a, a, a peak population and then, and then population are going to fall, right? And it's going to stabilize because people are not going to have kids anymore when they're 25. They go like, look, I'm going to live for 150. I'll just wait, right? And I'll have a second career. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I know so many people that are retired, right, and have wealth of experience and insight and life life lessons, and then they and then they end up in an old people's home. What what if you could tap into that experience? So like, no, you're still healthy, you're still sharp and bright, 
you know, you have another 50 years, so, you know, where how you can contribute to, to society. And that increases productivity plus the learning of younger people. Yeah, it's good, right? So, so, so I'm not too scared yeah. about, about living longer. I, eventually, it will be, it'll be a temporary, you know, bubble. But there'd be, be, be always, there'd be always a statistic for like the body, your brain might work well, but the body will just wear out, like with most things, the law of diminishing returns. So like in, no, your brain it, also diminishes yeah. over time. The whole thing diminishes. Yeah, so. and that, over oh, time. There's a new question there. That's great. That's great. <laughs> no, that begs the question, what is the theoretical capacity of the human brain for memory? How much of this can be recalled, access, oh, or scanned? That's a really good question. I don't think we know the answer to that. But I don't think we know the answer. How I mean, do you what measure you, that? Yeah. What if you can make more connections, right? What if you can replace, you know? Because uh, as you know, when, we, when we're born, we, uh, we're built with lots of connections and then we lose up till 20, 21, you know, we lose many of the connections that get pruned for useful connections. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and this is already happening for Parkinson's disease now. Right, like like in Parkinson's disease, dopaminergic uh, or neurons that make dopamine are dying. So, <coughs> some time ago, those dopaminergic neurons came from aborted fetuses, which is not a sustainable nor ethical source. But now you can make them from these pluripotent stem cells, and you can make them from your your own uh, cells. And clinical trials are already underway, and they seem to so be working you fine. Potentially encode. Right. Oh, yes. Once we are able to store to store information in the cells in the DNA themselves, yes, yes. I mean, that, uh, DNA is an amazing information storage medium, uh, really stable, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah. yeah man. I was going to ask. Really much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. Was such a treatment such as a Parkinson's where you put the dopaminergic neurons in? You said that um, with the stem cells, they'll be of the five five day old, um, how long will it take to I guess mature so it's actually effective? Uh, so you can, it, to make dopaminergic neurons takes I think about six to seven weeks. Okay, so, so after not, six to seven weeks. They're there, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're still fetal like though, but that doesn't seem to matter because when we take, took the neurons from the fetus, they, they worked fine as well, right? So, so yeah. Uh, it's not a, a, a permanent cure because there's also there, there was a reason why these dopaminergic neurons were dying, so you may need to come back after a while to get a second boost. But, but that's kind of regenerative medicine, I think, is super exciting. Okay. A couple more questions and then let's try to wrap up. Yeah, Lorraine, sorry. Uh, so, um, regarding organoids alive from dead human bodies, what do you think are the implications of that? Well, it. It, it, there is a philosophical question here, right? Let, let's, let's say about individuality, for example. Right? So let's say that you accept that an organoid after seven or nine months has consciousness, and we can demonstrate that, right? So now I make a thousand organoids, right? Do they have any moral status? Do they, do they, do they have rights, right? And, and are those rights the same rights as the individual that donated the cells? No, because that person is dead. Uh, so, 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 what right do they have, right? Do they, they are, if they are conscious, uh, God forbid that they can feel pain, right? Or if they are distressed by living in a in a locked in uh, environment. Do we need to put these things in our wheels? In our wheels. In our wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't. Yeah, I think we might have to wrap up soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think. Yeah, no, but you see, but you see, that there there are philosophical questions here yeah, about, yeah, about whether they have any whether whether oh. whether we should we should impart some rights to the to these to these entities. They can actually be that dead person. Yeah. We're we're pack, packing up soon. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're packing up. Yeah. Okay. Final thing is that, that I wanted to show you here, but uh, uh, in one one minute is that that uh, not only. Can we make different organoids, brain, heart? This is a, these are real beating heart cells from induced pluripotent stem cells, which we beat with the frequency of the fetal heart. You will not be surprised. Kidney that can filter. You can put these things together as well. You can imagine, you know, you can make, you can, you can put them together, mix them, and then you can test whether when you change your diet, you know, in the gut, 
organoids, uh, whether that and how that affects your brain, for example. And you can actually do some evidence based uh, uh, investigations. I've talked too long. Thank you so much. Thank you.